All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Vos from Lidos. I'm very excited to introduce our panel this morning. It's on the compute ecosystem. I think many of you know this is a, a, a huge initiative within this, a very important one. And um, Mr. Tony Purvis is going to lead us through it. Tony. Thank you. Thank you. So welcome, everyone, this morning. Can you hear me OK? Yes. No. I could uh, strap this to my lapel, but I don't think it's strappable. So. Um, so I'll just lean down. So welcome, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about the computing ecosystem. It's a new organization structure that, that we've moved to um, from the old deck structure. Um, with me today, um, I've got six of my eight lines of business, and the two other lines of business don't feel slighted. I see Cynthia. Where is Brent? I mean, uh, 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 Keith. I don't see Keith. So, um, so I'll, I'll introduce my lines of business. So... Rick Doring, he is the data center line of business chief. Mark Foster is the infrastructure line of business chief. And for those of you that know Rob Reed, that's not Rob Reed. That's John Rainey. John Rainey is the deputy to the comm line of business. Rob couldn't join us this week. Patrice Wilmot is the cyber services line of business. Bob Torres is server line of business. And Tanya Wilkes is my implementation and sustainment line of business, also referred to as INS. So to simplify that. So um, those are my six. Cynthia Siskowski is the special services line of business. And Keith Brennies, I don't see him in the audience, but he is my mainframe line of business chief. So, um, so as I get through this, I've got about six charts to go through to sort of give you guys a level set on the ecosystem. And then I've got some questions that I'm going to ask them. And, and hopefully there will be dialogue and you guys can ask questions at the end, okay? So part of the reason that we did this um, this is the deck structure um, and, and why we moved away from the deck structure. And if I leave you with one thing today, when you leave this session, never use the word deck again. Decks are no longer. We have moved to a virtual data center, to one virtual data center. So um, it's, it's even a little bit difficult for some of my staff to understand that in some documents and some paperwork and some up channels and service interruptions, we still see the word deck spattered out. So we, we even we're having a difficult time with this adjustment. So as, as we get through this, leave and no longer, decks are no longer. So um, you see in the bottom right corner some challenges that we've had um, of why we've moved to this structure um, from a standpoint of um, each deck director. In fact, I was just talking to, to someone about why we did this. Me being DEC Oklahoma City, the director there, I never realized, you know, when people would complain about, you know, DEC Oklahoma City did things differently than DEC Ogden, differently than DEC Mechanicsburg. I'm like, no, you guys don't understand. We're about 95%, you know, in line with each other. Maybe that 5% we do things differently. I would really be in de almost in defensive mode. Um, as we've moved into the ecosystem, I'm starting to realize that it wasn't 95%. It was probably in the 50 to 60% range. So there are lots of things that we're uncovering and, and trying to optimize and trying to standardize as we get into this. So that's the reason that we've moved into the ecosystem from the decks. Um, from a, uh, one of the things, one of the big reasons um, is we've continually cut cost over the years. Um, and, and you see down there um, duplicate overhead costs. Uh, back in, what, 2015, we cut 10%. 2016, we cut 10%. In 17, we're cutting another 7% of, of our cost to reduce our rate structure. Really, we were at the point of we couldn't continue to cut without some big forcing function. So that's what this ecosystem is. It's a forcing function for us to really think, and think outside the box and how we did things. Um, before we had what we called cost containers. So we had a group of people that managed cost and a different group of people that managed revenue. And the two shall not meet. Um, and that was a problem that people, you know, they controlled their cost, but the other people controlled the, the, the revenue and the billing side of this. So within the lines of business structure, that's one of their major tasks is they have net operating result or positive cost revenue of responsibility within that line of business. So it's really tasking those eight people to run that complete line of business. You see the locations up there. The locations are staying the same. Um, what we call these places now, I mentioned that decks are no longer what we call these places. We call them data centers. That's what they are. They're a data center. They're no, no longer a defense enterprise computing center. Um, so you will no longer hear me say the word deck. It's, it's gone from the briefing from now. So – 
from a computing environment, the people that have been around um, the either computing services, enterprise um, services, whatever we've been called from a directorate standpoint, you see in here that we've gone from 194 sites back in 1990 um, down to what I'm calling one virtual data center. Um, so whether it be back in 93 when we stood up, we were called defense mega centers. Uh, then we moved into something called um, regional support activities and area commands back in the late 90s. Then we moved into something called system management centers um, where the big sites and the small sites were processing elements. Um, then we said, oh no, we don't make a distinction between sites, now we are all decks. Now we are one virtual data center. So we've, we've grown up with these changing of names and changing things, so this is just the next iteration in what we're doing. So lines of business is really no different than what industry does. You know, we've, we, we've got, you know, a, a group of people that are tasked with similar responsibilities, sim similar functions, um, and they have that, like I mentioned, the entire function of cost and revenue. They control everything. So in the past, the deck directors would always blame headquarters for cutting things and doing things and giving direction down, and we wouldn't have any responsibility of or, or any be involved in the decision making for those things that were being forced on us. Now, no longer can these lines of business say that because they are responsible for the strategic direction, the tactical direction, the day-to-day -day ops, the cost and revenue. So they're really self-contained. They are responsible for everything dealing with that function. Um, you see the lines of business over to the um, left. Um, so we've got communications. That line of business is, is responsible for the glass house communications within the data centers. So it's from the, the point of presence, the, the premise router, all the way down to the edge switches. Um, not to be confused with what DISA Global does. DISA Global manages the Doden. John Rainey and his group, they manage the glass house comm within the data centers. Um, cyber services, Patrice Wilmot, she manages all of the functions that deal with cyber, the auditing function, the scanning functions, all the HBSS, ACAS. Um, she also has, her mission is really unique because she picked up um, or, or retained a lot of, of, of appropriated funded functions that she supports across DISA. So she has a lot of um, ISSM PMOs that actually support programs outside of the ecosystem. She's the only line of business that has that um, function that supports things outside. The other seven line of business only support things within the ecosystem. Um, data center line of business, uh, they manage the data centers themselves. So Rick is, is responsible for the floor management, the power, the facility management at, at every one of our facilities, as well as the capacity contracts are, are under Rick from a program management standpoint, as well as what we're calling our command and control cell. So any incident management functions, idle processes from an incident management, problem management, Rick is responsible for that single point of, of focus outside of the ecosystem to either the, the DISA command center or to other groups. Um, he does all the releases of ASIs, all that um, comes out of the C2 cell. Um, Tanya Wilkes, implementation and sustainment. She has two big functions, implementation. Um, so all of the project leads, all of the um, um, system requirements forms, all of the letter estimates that are produced from a new business standpoint, Tanya does that from the implementation side. From the sustainment side, she's also responsible for application support and database management support that's a, uh, that's a reimbursable bill to our customers. Infrastructure line of business is responsible for all of our enterprise virtualization teams, whether it be um, our VMware environment under x86 uh, or using um, the HPUX or Solaris virtualization layers. He's responsible for that, as well as the entire storage management team. Also under Mark is the idle processes of change management and configuration management. So he's the process owner for those idle processes. Uh, mainframe line of business, Keith isn't up here, but mainframe line of business, obviously, that's a soups to nuts, controls everything with the mainframe, both IBM mainframe and Unisys mainframe, sits under Keith. Uh, server line of business, all the system admins um, work for Bob. Um, he's got about 350-ish people that, that work in the server line of business, so Bob is responsible for all the system admins for all the sites and most of the applications. And if I haven't mentioned something, then special services is that last line of business that we created. Um, and the things that are in special services are enterprise email, mobility, um, the coalition forces that, that were used to be managed out of Columbus. So Cynthia has those unique functions that we didn't want to break up a group that was already cohesive, and she manages those things.
so I've talked about the, the differences that each deck showed or each site had, and that's what's depicted on the right side up there is every site had their own processes, their own reports that they would give uh, customers. They had their, they patched systems in a certain way. They, they interfaced with customers in different ways. So as we move from the before to the after, that's the big so what when it comes to this ecosystem is standard support. So when a customer goes to data center Ogden, they're going to get the same support as if they were going to data center Mechanicsburg. Um, we're going to begin patching very standard, very similarly. Um, we're going to have implementations. Um, customers continue to um, hit us up on the timelines that it takes to get from a system requirements form out to an uh, application becoming at its initial IOC. Um, so we're standardizing those processes. Something I've tasked all the LOBs to do is how do we create a, a process to where we shrink that timeline going from SRF to actually IOC by 40%. Um, some customers say it takes over 300 and 400 days to, to do that. How can we shrink that way down? So Tanya's is tasked with leading that effort, working with the different lines of business. Um, and then also from an offering standpoint, um, every site used to do their own thing and, and they would have boutique services. They would give this Navy customer or this Air Force customer. What we've got to do is we've got to standardize. And that's what part of their lines of business is looking at is standardization. And then from a timeline standpoint, so um, this was announced last year. We developed all the work in 16. Uh, 17, January of 17 is when we um, stood up initially. Officially, we were stood up in, in February. So we've, we've been at this about five, five or six months. Um, and that's what I told them, and I've told the staff as I've gone out to the different sites, is 17 is the year that we understand what we have. Um, so it's, it's that learning period where if we didn't know something, we, this is the year that, that we've got um, sort of grace to figure out how it's going. Um, as we get into 18, 18 is the year that we've got to begin optimizing. Um, so 18 is optimization year, and then our standardization year, and then 19 is when we optimize what we just standardized. So um, those are the timelines. Um, with that, I will start throwing questions to the panel. Um, so, that's a pretty good time. So, Rick and Bob, um, from a standpoint, what new capacity contracts do you see coming and when will they be released? Is on? Okay. So, so, I'll take part of that. Um, so, uh, right now we have for our networking inside the glass house, like Tony said, uh, we have a contract that supports that. We're recompeting that contract, so it's called CSC2. Um, it, it's out on the street now, so we're in the middle of that. So, that, so that's one major effort that we're working on. Um, another major effort that uh, we've got coming probably in FY18 is we will be looking to recompete our storage contract. Um, so we have a, a storage contract that supports all of our storage needs inside the data center, and that'll be a major one coming out in FY18 as well. So. So a lot of you may be aware that on the 8th of May, we released the five chipsets, the X86, Spark, Itanium, P-Series, and the Z-Series chipset recompetes. That was released in two contracts. Uh, we are progressing through the Q&A part of the, the process. Expect to have the questions for all five of those chipsets back on the street within the next week or so. And expect to award the zip contract sometime early in the next fiscal year and the XS86 or XS contract uh, early in the next calendar year. On top of that, we have another initiative that we're working, just called the IPCS contract. It's the integrated processor contract. That, that is still in uh, the, the draft stage, and we expect to have that released later on this summer. So, Tanya and... Tanya and Mark, um, in, in the previous session earlier this morning, John Hale mentioned about the DISA cloud services. Um, what are we doing in the ecosystem to support those offerings from a cloud services standpoint? So, so, so I think uh, most of you know, so uh, MilCloud 2.0 is just awarded, which is sort of a departure from, I guess, the, the way we provide cloud services to our customers. In essence, it's a vendor-provided uh, environment. I think uh, probably the biggest way that we can, uh, we're, we're looking forward to supporting that is working closely with the vendor uh, to not only learn lessons, I mean, but to share our, some of the lessons we learned with MilCloud 
1.0, and specific, specifically the lessons we learned from some of our mission partners. Uh, obviously, uh, our goal is to, to maximize you know, adoption by our customers and do whatever uh, it, it takes to, 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 uh, to make that happen, to, to work with our mission partners. Um, hi. So uh, I think the other thing that we're going to be doing or that we're already doing is as mission partners, as we're talking to them about their requirements and what they're thinking about, um, we're providing them with what we provide, uh, what types of services we provide, and sure they understand the capabilities we provide versus what a cloud provider would provide. So they're making informed decisions as they go through that process. The other questions that they're asking is, how do I transition, if I want to do that, from a data center into the cloud? And that's something we're going to have to work through on how does that transition occur and how can we help them facilitate that. Thank you. So um, for Bob and Mark, um, what are you doing to get more efficient under the ecosystem in your respective areas? All right, uh, so, I'll, so I'll go first. So one of the, uh, particularly in the storage area, uh, most of our mission partners, storage continues to be one of the major cost drivers in, in their, their bill to us. And obviously one of the things that we want to do, I mean, General Lynn talked a lot about innovation. We want to make sure that uh, we maximize innovation in the storage area. Rick mentioned we're going to be going out with a recompete of, of our, our storage as a service contract. Obviously we're looking for, uh, you know, uh, the, the, obviously the best performance at the lowest cost. Uh, obviously, one of the things, for instance, we're going to be doing, looking at is probably uh, moving away from spinning disk and going to solid state uh, drives. Uh, any other innovations that you know allow us to uh, provide the capability at a lower cost. Uh, high, obviously, availability uh, storage is one of those things we'd like. We would like to ultimately get to the goal. We have 100% availability. It never goes down. Uh, we're looking for you guys to help us and uh, give us ideas on how to do that. Um, from a mission partner standpoint, one of the things we always get hit um, hit at by our, from our mission partners on the storage side is archive requirements, right? I mean, uh, mission partners are, are getting uh, demands put on to archive more and more data. Uh, the amount of the, 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 the amount of data that that um, the storage that these customers are using is growing, and obviously, to um, you know, the, the, the key piece that we're going to be looking at is making that not only the, the best performance but also affordable for our customers. So in the server line of business, I'm attacking uh, my efficiencies on two fronts. The first is technology. What can, what can industry bring to me in one of the five or the RFPs I mentioned earlier? What can it bring to me to, to reduce my footprint? And on the second front, I'm looking to re-engineer my people so that uh, they're more masters of fewer trades than, than jack of all trades. Right now, the way we... we engineered our SAs is, is they are responsible for everything on a box. I'm trying to re-engineer that or, or re-approach that so that a group of server or a group of SAs will do the operating system. Another group will do Active Directory or they'll do IIS services or they'll become specialists in, in, in one area as opposed to trying to be the jack of all trades. The, the primary, the, the technology aspect, again, I'm, I'm looking for for what can I do with technology to reduce the footprint? Can I put, for instance, like the general said yesterday, can I put a, a GPU on a motherboard and, and serve up uh, static web content a lot more efficiently? Can I deploy an i4 chipset in the Itanium world and cut my Itanium boxes in half? You know, everything I do to reduce my footprint or the amount of servers that I have to maintain makes me more efficient in, in, in how I deploy my people. So two fronts, re-engineering my people and using technology. So for, for Tanya and Patrice, what are you doing to reduce timelines to provide faster service and what uh, type of things are you looking to implement? So Tony, you, you stole part of my answers um, in the introduction, but I'm going to reuse them because standardization is extremely important. Uh, what we found is we brought together all of the, from the different sites, implementation guides, we found that each site was just a little different. And so that did tend to slow down the process. And if you're a mission partner and you're implementing at one site, it was different at another site. So we are standardizing those processes and looking at things that don't need to be done anymore. Why did we do that? Do we still need to do that? And what things can we do better? As we're doing that, we're working with the lines of business. 
to ensure that we have, and I'm going to say end-to-end, -end, but a process that gets us all the way through an implementation. Uh, the second thing we're doing is much what, what Bob was talking about is retooling the force and retraining the force. How can we ask, part of the, part of the timeline uh, involves getting that requirement from a mission partner. And the tendency is some mission partners know all they want and some know kind of what they want and some know they wanted something, right? So how do we ask the right questions and have that dialogue so we can get a good baseline requirement faster and so we go through, when we go through the implementation process, we're not going back and forth asking additional questions if things aren't clear. Yes, things change and we'll take care of that, but we want to get a good baseline in the beginning so we can get the process started as quickly as possible. Um, the third thing that, and I think many of the others have already talked about, is standardization across the board, or not standardization, but automation across the board is going to help our implementation processes as well. Um, if we can get the requirement defined quickly and sufficiently, and things can be implemented in an automated way, taking man, man and woman out of the loop, it, where we might induce error in time, I think we'll implement a lot faster. Am I on? Oh, it is? Okay. So from a cyber perspective, and um, I first have to say, typically we find that cyber is at the end of the process, and then everyone wants to blame cyber for being the problem in the implementation. So we are doing more work up front with mission partners, really talking to them about their design, understanding um, what those challenges are going to be before it gets into the ecosystem. But as we're going through the ecosystem, we're also, with the joining of all the different um, data centers, we've been able to really uh, capture some of the best practices and, and get a better understanding of what we need to look at as things are being implemented. From an industry perspective, I think the most help we could really use is help with um, capabilities that help us assess those applications up front, um, better looking at code, things like that, because really, I mean, we've been very focused on the infrastructure, but those systems and applications, this is really where the rubber meets the road. And we don't want to put things out there that are going to put um, the data at risk. So I would say from our perspective, we've already done some streamlining of that implementation process. There's a lot more to do. We are going to put more um, accountability back on the program managers and their authorizing officials. But those are the things I would see happening probably in FY18. Thank you. So for uh, John and Bob, I know we've started some automation pro projects. Um, can you talk about what you've done and where you see the automation side for both comm and server going? So in the server line of business, I have uh, two immediate problems I'm trying to tackle. First off, I need to preach to my people that, that automation is, is, is not the elimination of their roles. I, I keep telling them that I have enough work to keep everybody gainfully employed. So we need... We need to embrace automation as an everyday process. It's not. It's not the. I've written down. It's. It's not the end to the. Or it's not the start to an end. It's a continual process that that my people are trying to embrace on a daily basis. I keep telling them we, we make ourselves more efficient. I'll take. I'll take my cuts and vacancies. It, it will not ever be in a, in a live person. And trying to get that point across to them. But the second thing is is I'm looking at holistically across my line of business. My automation tools, if they don't fit, if they have limitations, then, then we're going to get rid of them. You know, right now, and I'm not saying I'm getting rid of Blade Logic, but our predominant tool is Blade Logic. We're, we're, we're scrubbing Blade Logic to make sure that, that what it was promised to deliver, it's going to deliver. And if it doesn't, we'll either augment it or we'll replace it. So, I mean, <clears throat> to copy or follow on what Bob is saying, is that some of our stuff, we see our... Everybody comes to calm, so we see ourselves as a force, a forcing enabler, where we can help reduce the time for new builds from bare metal to production. Uh, so we're supporting project schedules within Tanya's group and, and other so other lobs within the group meeting their schedules. Our our whole focus right now is to reduce or eliminate human error, so we can decrease the number of incidents or outages to our mission partners, as well as cost avoidance and cost savings internal to our lobs, since we're responsible for our financials now. Uh, we've seen some some pretty good cost savings so far. Uh, we have kind of continual service improvement outlook or to how we do our business. 
So we're always looking at, at the tools we currently use and the tools that are out there that may serve us better in the future. Thank you. On, on the next one, um, Bob and Mark, what are some barriers to virtualization and standardization in your two lines of business? So what I've seen in the, in the two months that I've had the line of business, there's a lot of perceived barriers to virtualization. And I've written down six of them. Uh, enterprise applications can't be virtualized. We have enterprise applications that are virtualized. Program manager does, lacks the funds to virtualize them. Virtualization doesn't take any funds. If, if it works, we move it over to a virtualized environment and it runs. Uh, the customer is still wanting to do that box hugging mentality. Right? They want they want to understand that, that they're running an environment, that box is theirs, they can control it. That's that's not cost effective. Uh, the lingering belief that, that certain software products do not run well in, in a virtualized environment, that's another fallacy. And then the, the big one that we always get thrown back is, is the accreditation. My application is not accredited to, to run in a virtualized environment. Every time we've tackled that, we've, we've been successful in, in, in getting past that accreditation barrier. So, so about five of the, the most more prevalent uh, roadblocks to virtualization. In my line of business, we are, we're about 65% virtualized. Uh, we're looking, I've tasked my people to start looking to see about that other 35%, especially, especially important as we go through the tech refresh of, of almost 6,000 physical environments. Those 6,000 physical environments are gonna take hard outages. If I can get half of those or some kind of percentage over on the virtualized world, those virtualized environments, they transition very easily between the current environment and the next environment. So hopefully tech refresh and, and the cost savings, we can convince some, uh, some more customers to, to refresh and get past those barriers. So Bob was pretty complete in his answer, so I'll, so I'll, so I'll, I'll just add a, a, a couple of my uh, observations. So, I mean, uh, I'm not a real technical guy, but there's really very few technical reasons that you can't virtualize something. And as we move towards a, you know, towards a cloud environment where we're, we're promoting people going to the cloud, I mean, obviously virtualization is a key piece of it. Uh, one of the things I, I think it's going to happen, it's evolve over time, is one of the, the technical considerations. I mean, generally you'll talk to people who have very large databases and, then, and they, they run those databases on physical servers. Uh, I, I think we're gonna evolve that we're gonna probably, you know, build bigger VOEs, right? I mean, we're gonna build, you know, that technical limitation, that perceived technical limitation, uh, obviously we can overcome that. And then, you know, systems that traditionally you wouldn't expect to be able to be run in a cloud environment, I think over time, I think we're going to be able to run those systems in a cloud environment, uh, and we're going to evolve. Uh, you know, I, I know that one of the key tenets that was talked about was innovation. I mean, uh, you know, and Tony's talked, I mean, to a lot of you guys, and I've talked to you. I mean, we're looking to partner with you guys. Tell us what we're doing wrong. Tell us what we're doing right. But... Um, uh, you know, my previous life working for Mission Partner Engagement, I mean, I think, as Bob mentioned, a lot of the, the reasons that people didn't want to virtualize things were, were perceived, perceived things. And, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, not only do we need to, you know, pass the message of virtualization is doable, but as you guys have the same relationships with these same mission partners, I mean, I think, you know, we ask that you pass on those same things. I mean, and... and uh, ideally, I mean, I think that at some point in time, maybe we'll be almost entirely virtualized as the technology evolves even more. Thank you. And, and this is a plug for Patrice Wilmot has a, another session in this room at 1.30 um, later on cyber services. So, Patrice, over to you, and you can plug as much of your next session as you want. Um, so, paid advertisement here. Um, so, how do you see RMF changing the way that the ecosystem interacts with our mission partners? So I think RMF in general um, really offers um, an opportunity to, um, I think, streamline and do a better job with security and risk management in general. From the ecosystem perspective, you know, our goal is to really be able to provide as many of the controls required in RMF to our mission partners as possible, which reduces the timelines people have to put into their own accreditation. Packages. I don't know how familiar you are because I talk about RMF all the time, so sometimes I'm kind of talking a little too in the weeds. But from an RMF perspective, when you're looking at controls, those are really the procedures and mechanisms you're putting in place 
to secure that system that you're um, hosting in our environment. So with RMS, we're going from what old DIACAP, I think it was about 155 controls to about 862. And when you start adding sub-controls to that, it's about 2,600 things we're looking at, right? So again, I think from an ecosystem perspective, we're looking to provide kind of a graduated level of services so that you can kind of choose what you want um, and we'll provide the controls accordingly. If you let us patch it, Will, we're going to provide you quite a few controls. But again, but we're, going, we're really looking at how do we make that better for the mission partner. We've already got um, inherited controls out there in the network and the facilities arena, so um, we're really digging deeper to say what other things are shared and how do we provide more of those. And when I say provide that, it's what evidence, how do we show that we're meeting that control, controls are designed, do that assessment, and then provide that data back to the mission partners or the program managers who are hosting in our environment. From an overall RMF perspective, really, RMF is more than controls, right? I mean, we start there. But we're really, the, the main factor for RMF is that continuous monitoring. Not just saying we've put that control in place, we've got an accreditation. How do we continually look at what we have implemented and ensure we're um, continuing to manage the risk of that environment? So I would say that's the bigger shift we're having in the ecosystem. I'll tell you, bringing all these different skill sets into one place, from my perspective, has been amazing. And I was, when I walked into this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be one of the probably most difficult jobs I'll ever have. But uh, the skills that we have out there and the people who really understand security has just been amazing from my perspective. So we have been able to do a better job of assessing um, the risk of those systems and providing that information back. So this afternoon I'll talk a little more about this, but when I think of the total value of the ecosystem, what's our objective speed? How do we get the information, know what vulnerabilities, know what risk we have in our environment, and get that information acted upon? So some of that's really going to require many partnerships. You know, whether it's a mission partner or program, hey, we just saw this, we need to let you know sooner rather than later so that you can take action, allow us to patch, or give us the um, permission to patch at will. It's gonna be up to that mission partner, but the point is we can get things acted upon so that we reduce the risk to our environment. Um, let me think, sorry, I just got went off on a tangent, didn't I? And auditing, that's the third piece I'm, I think, auditing, monitoring, how do we report? That's gonna be another area I'm gonna talk a little more about this afternoon. But my major focus really is on how do we get down to that application level, get the information out to the person who owns that application so that we can take action, which I see as a benefit to the department. This is more than DESA. I actually have systems internal and external to DESA. So I'm looking at this really being the opportunity for us to change the way we're approaching this across the department. Thanks, Patrice. So the last question I have for them, um, and they've touched on it throughout the, the entire answering of, of different questions, but how can either the mission partners or industry help us do what we need to do over the next 12 to 18 to 24 months? So I'll throw that open to anyone who, who wants to start. So, Tanya? I'll go first. Thank you. Um, good question, Tony. Um, from a, an industry and or mission partner perspective, as you're looking at your requirements, bring us in sooner rather than later um, so that we can help you to develop what will work within our infrastructure or if there's something we need to modify to make that work. I think the earlier we partner, the more successful we'll all be and we'll get that system in or the application established a lot faster. Um, the second thing I would, I would uh, say is that flexibility. If you have some flexibility in your technology to work within ours, that will help us tremendously as well. Uh, we also have to look at being flexible in, in, in how we're doing things and how we're bringing things in. Uh, we want to standardize where we can, where it makes sense. And then I know from my six-month experience in doing this now, as soon as I standardize, you guys come up with this bright new idea, which is really good. And so I have to change a little bit. Um, but we still need to standardize where we can and then flex where we need to. 
So I was raising her to the mic because I gave her that answer earlier today. So no, that was good. that was mine. But but you guys know our boundaries. You know your products need to have cert, you know it has to be state compliant, has to be CAC enabled to part. You know, you know our rules, and like Tanya said, bring us in early. We'll help you get through those rules. We're not you know we're not an impediment to you to you pitching something to our mission partners. We're we're here to help them run that that solution once it's you know once they res once it resonates with them we want to help run that that's our business we want we want those things in our data centers so get us in early and you know we'll, we'll help run through the the hurdles that that it requires to, to get that into our data centers yeah, and, and, and I like to just tag off of what uh, Tanya said about flexibility I mean one of the things I think that uh, is important to us is uh, that flexibility helps us just operate it better and can gives our mission partners better uptime. Um, but also, we need the flexibility to move forward in technology. So I, I think one of the things that we see is, you know, as we go through tech refreshes and we go through upgrades and things like that, there's, there's some technology that is out there that is designed to just move forward, and there's some that's not. And we really need to be in that mode where the technology can move forward quickly for the mission partner's sake, for, for our, our, you know, operation of that. And so bring solutions that can move forward so that it's not tied to uh, the, the old way of doing things because technology is going so fast. And we've got to keep those mission partners moving forward, and we can't have solutions that hold us back. You know, and I'll just add one thing too. We're, we're talking about new solutions. I mean, many times I think people perceive us that we're, you know, we're slow, and, and sometimes we don't adopt the most current technology. Uh, everybody's just got to understand. I mean, we want to have the best technology, but the price point's got to be there, right? I mean, we're we're held very accountable by our mission partners to cost, right? And we got to keep our rates down. So although you may have the greatest solution in the world, if if, if the price point's not there. I mean, you're going to have a solution that we could go out and present to our mission partners, but nobody's going to want it because they can't afford it. So I think, you know, when, when you guys are deciding, to, you know, uh, approaching us with the, the next great thing, I mean, just, just, just keep that in mind. Keep the price point in mind. And, and like Rick said, too, is, I mean, uh, we, we can't, because we operate as an enterprise, we can't continue to go forward with just one-off solutions, right? I mean, we have to, we, we look for technology and solutions that can be apl applied across the board that, that could, could, could solve many solutions, or many, many issues or tech um, shortfalls that our mission partners have. But, but price is it. I mean, I mean it, especially in today's environment, I mean, cost is becoming more and more important. And I think sometimes, you know, our mission partners come with us because they've talked to one of you industry partners, and, and then we come and we, we pursue the technology, and the price point's just not there. And, I mean, it, and, you know, we end up having disappointed mission partners. And I think sort of the message here is get us involved early on. I mean, talk to us first, and we'll help you sell the technology to the mission partners. Yeah, I think, I think I'm on the back end of that. So part of the challenge, I've heard this at other Air Force conferences, is that, you know, there's a lot of great tools out there that vendors have. But we have a lot of tools now, and we're not probably leveraging the full capacity that we could now. So as we move forward into newer tools or newer capabilities for the markets that we support, for the mission partners we support, we need to better, we need to know better how we can integrate and implement and use those tools to a more full capacity than what we are. And I got to get out of this constant learning churn of different tools, and it just kills us. And we're not really providing the level of support I think we could provide Given we have, the, given we have a better opportunity to learn, actually learn the tool itself. So. Okay, so that completes the panel session. So now I will open it up to questions from you guys. Any questions? Chris Parashuk, Nova Corporation. Um, so my question, probably more for Tony at your level. DISA recently put out an RFI for the next iteration of GSMO. I've talked with several other leaders in the DISA enterprise side specifically. I wanted to get your thought in addition to the panel's thoughts on kind of the practicality of ecosystems, contracts, merging with the uh, transport side of the house. Okay. Um, the future of that and the implication it will have on small businesses because a lot of that spread currently across small businesses today. So. So. Great question, Chris. In fact, I, I, if no one was going to ask this, I was going to end with that um, conversation topic. So um, the RFI was released. Um, 
Mr. Bennett asked, so, so the way that the operations center is structured is there's four directorates under Mr. Bennett, with services directorate being one of them, and that's where the ecosystem resides. Working directly for Mr. Bennett is the logistics group, the finance group, and the manpower group. So logistics works directly for Mr. Bennett. Um, that guidance came down from Mr. Bennett that, hey, let's see what industry thinks about the it was really, a, and, and I think in the RFI they threw out a, like three or four different deck contracts in that RFI to say, hey, what do you guys think about this? If you were a small business, you hated it. If you were a big business, you said, I'm all for it. So um, what we've been having meetings since that RFI went out, and actually next week in Oklahoma City, I've got the log people that work the GSMO contract coming to Oklahoma City um, because we like to think that we're special in the computing side. Um, no one understands how to host applications um, if they're focused on the Doden and how to manage contracts in the Doden. So um, we've got them coming to Oklahoma City. We're going to educate them on the computing side of the house. Um, but the overarching plan is this. Um, we're going down two paths. We are going to look at GSMO. We're going to see, is that a direction we want to go? We've had conversations with um, Sharon Jones, small business. Um, big concern is about 80% of our contracts are with small business today. And, and for those of you that don't know, the ecosystem is made up of about 1,400 civilians and 1,000 contractors. So there's about 2,400 people in this ecosystem thrown in these eight line of, lines of business. So we're talking 1,000 contractors spread across about 80 contracts. Um, so what we do know is we've got to do contract consolidation. Um, how we do that is still on the table um, for decision. Um, so we're going two paths. We are, we are looking at a way to merge, consolidate, do something on the contract side to have two or three contracts per line of business. So right now, our, our tech services contracts, we've got one contract, say, with 50 people, and Rick may have seven of them, and Mark may have three of them, and John may have eight of them, and they're spread across. And, and um, for, in, in the past, when you had a deck director at a site, you know, a vendor would come see me, and I would tell them about all my people, all the contracts, and I managed all those contracts. Well, today, you go to Rick, and he has a portion of them, and then you go to Mark, and he has a portion of them. So I understand that's very frustrating for you guys because you don't know, who do I talk to? Do I talk to all eight of them? Well, today, yes. That's who you talk to. These six people and the other two. Um, because they manage those contracts. I don't. Um, but from a strategy standpoint, we are moving toward two or three contracts per line of business. Now, how do we get there? That's the hard part. Um, because on our contracts, you know, I mentioned there's roughly a thousand contractors on, on our contracts. We share those contracts with other people outside the ecosystem. So there are some people in ID that use our contracts. There are some people in um, mission partner engagement, MPEO, that use our contracts. So how do we do two or three contracts per line of business? Um, we're targeting sometime middle FY19 to do the first awards of those contracts. So we've got to line up all of these other contracts based on option years, based on when they expire, going to two or three per line of business. Um, next week when the GSMO people are in Oklahoma City, we're going to talk about the potential of using the comm line of business and the cyber services line of business as a potential for GSMO. The other six lines of business are going this other path, which is two or three per line of business um, spread out um, with different option years, different timing to where we don't have some big bang of, for instance, in server, I think Bob has 180 contractors, I think, 170 contractors. We don't want those 170 contractors, if there's a big turnover, all at one time. We've got to adjust those timelines, adjust those schedules to where if there's some big turnover with a, with a vendor, we don't, we're not stuck with losing 170 people for a month or two months or, or, or something. So, so that's the strategy, Chris, is the six lines of business, two or three per line of business. We're potentially looking at using cyber and comm for GSMO, but that decision is not final yet. So that's, that's where we're headed. We, we don't know which vehicle we're going to use, DES, Encore, Encore 3. We don't know. We, we just know that we're lining these schedules up. So right now, each of the lines of business have um, what we're calling a roadmap, which is going to list all their tasks that they're going to be responsible for in their line of business. Because as you guys know, you may have a contract in Ogden that the system admin tasks were written this way, and system admin tasks and mechanics were written this way. 
they're all basically doing the same thing. So how do we standardize those tasks in one set of system admin tasks or one set of database tasks? That's what the lines, lines of business are looking at now. That's due up to log by the end of June. So in the end of June, we're going to start developing, okay, here's where we want to go. Now we start laying out some big master schedule of how we take these 80 contracts and merge them into 16 to 20. Um, so a lot of hard work has to get done in the next six months um, to line those things up, to submit, you know, our, there will be RFIs that come out on these contracts to say, hey, can small business do this? I would be amazed if every small business company said they can't do it. They're going to say yes. So more than likely, it's going to go small business in some realm. Uh, we don't know the vehicle it's going to use. Um, but that's the strategy of where we're headed over the next 18 to 24 months with, with contracts, labor contracts. Okay. Next question. My question is uh, with respect to innovation, because I heard the uh, panelists talk about innovation. Um, a good example that comes to my mind is uh, Red Hat. Mm -hmm. They have their Red Hat um, operating system, and then they have Fedora, which is an umbrella a group where they allow the industry to come and play around. Whatever good they see in Fedora, they move it into to Red Hat. Does this, uh, using this line of businesses, have any umbrella structure where we can bring in uh, industry instead of waiting for them to approach us. So within that uh, uh, sandbox, we can play and we can get ideas. Bob? <laughs> <laughs> I answered the easy one, so. So I, I think the, the, the easy answer is, is we don't dictate what our app, what operating system our applications run in, and if I understand the gentleman's question was, was can we offer different versions of, of Red Hat or different versions of Linux? Was that your question? No, it was more of a sandbox. More was, of a sandbox. Yeah, yeah. So, so can we build a sandbox for this environment for people to come in and, and just play and test and do different? Just things. an umbrella. Yeah. We don't tell them what to do. Yeah. But they come in. Yeah. So, so we can do that, but we have to. It has to pay for itself. I mean, somehow we have to to generate revenue into it. I, I, I mean. um, yeah. So, so that's the that that's the problem that, that our so right now the the ecosystem as a whole is about a billion dollars a year in, in cost and revenue. And every year when we budget, we've got to have that billion dollars. Hopefully, it's going to be shrinking as we as we start cutting costs and becoming more efficient. But we bill our customers for that billion dollars. So our mission, different mission partners within the different agencies and services, pay that entire billion dollars a year. So based on that, if we built something, we've got to do it as a service. We've got to be able to sell it. We've got to be able to either roll it in as overhead, which potentially increases our cost. I like the idea. Now, what typically we do is we, when we award, Bob and Rick both mentioned our capacity contracts. Um, when we award those contracts, we award them, and that's our partner in these things. So if today our x86 contract is with HP, um, we could very easily go to HP and say, hey, what's new? Let's use one of your labs to build something, to do something in. We do the same thing with Oracle on the, on the um, Solera side. So once we establish our, our contracts from a capacity standpoint, that's our partner, and we're really using them for that innovation and using their environments because we're sort of already paying for it through those contracts. So, but building it in our data center is a little bit difficult from a testing, development, do we build the separate network? We're talking some zone B environments from a development standpoint. So how do we do that in a secure environment? Because we've got to segregate them off to where if someone's playing over here, it's not going to possibly go into the production side from a security cyber standpoint. So um, we've also, you know, we mentioned earlier, we've awarded MillCloud 2. So with MillCloud 2.0, um, customers can do that themselves in a MillCloud Mil environment. They can do it today in MillCloud 1.0. They'll be able to do something similar in MillCloud 2.0. The customers can come in and play. But as far as us building something, it's, we're always looking at cost, and, and that's really the, the driving factor why we probably are not in that realm. Cost and then the cyber side of how we protect that and enclave that off to where people that play don't come in and impact production.
we've had actually we've had people you know Tony's mentioned the cloud environment we've had mission partners come in and we'll set up a, a cloud environment get a product loan agreement for a particular software manufacturer that will let them test drive it in a, an environment then when you're done test driving just get rid of the you know you just say I don't want the environment anymore the, the product loan agreement is gone and, and I mean there, there are mechanisms to do it I mean it's not all that it can't be done I mean I just think if you're looking for us to build a, a traditional sandbox for everybody to share I think cloud is probably would be the recommendation we would give you to go to Mill Cloud, do it on your own, because I think we have the mechanisms that you can do it on your own. It's that I don't think we would be willing to do it at an enterprise level. I build like a huge sandbox for everybody to come in and play. Then the other thing also is uh, something like a forum, just like this, mm -hmm. a forum that doesn't have require any physical uh, infrastructure mm -hmm. where ideas are shared. Uh, a good example is that um, um, in using Forescout. Mm -hmm. We've set up a forum where we reach across the entire DOD for everybody that um, um, is implementing Forescout. We want to hear what you've done. What have you done better? What can we learn from you? What policies do you have? Stuff like that. Yeah. It doesn't require yeah. any money just okay. to get the people together. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Chris, any other questions? <laughs> okay, if that's it, thank you guys.